Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for another video. My name is Voodoo Pickles and today I'm going to be sharing with you the books that I read in July, which is super exciting. We finished July with 12 books. 12! That was more than I read last month and this, this is just so great. When I first started my reading challenge for this year, which was very broadly just to read more, I was anticipating one to two books a month. That was it. That was my goal for this year is to read one or two books a month. And so far we are exceeding our goal, which is great. And we read 12 books. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> so the first book we read this month was Gone Girl. And this is by Gillian Flynn. It was published in 2012. And I listened to this on an audiobook at around 20 hours and this book inspired some true or I guess inspired some true crime cases. There's a very prominent true crime case out there that is always described as being the real life Gone Girl. And it was originally the reason why I was like, you know what, I'll pick it up. I know that story, that true crime story and what happened there. I don't know. The material, the, like the source material it came from. So I picked this up and this one is, it has two main characters. It is Amy and Nick, which are our main characters. They're a married couple. On their fifth anniversary, Amy goes missing. She's just missing. Gone and nobody knows where she's at. Nick starts to freak out. He has to call the police. He has to let people know what happened. And the first part of the book, we go through Nick's whole experience being interrogated by the police, interrogated, or like interviewed by media, and trying to navigate this situation. And sprinkled throughout there, we get Amy's... Um, I don't want to say perspective. It's sprinkled throughout there, we get entries within Amy's diary, which coincide usually with memories that Nick has going through all kinds of things that happened in their past relationship. So it starts to look like Nick killed Amy. And that's about the first half of the book. And then after that, it goes just balls to the wall crazy. Like, so crazy. I was like, wait what's going on and I'm not going to tell you the twists twists there are multiple in this book twists that happen but that's the part that everybody knows if you know the gone girl thing it's similar the gone the true life case it's similar to that except way extreme and if this person got away with every like the the amount of planning and everything that went into this whole situation I was just like wow kudos kudos to you and i really enjoyed everything that happened to this like the first twist i was like okay i kind of figured that was gonna happen but the second third maybe fourth i gasped i legit gasped i had to stop what i was doing and i had to sit there and process what was going on because i was just like wow that was great so i gave this book a four out of five and that was how we started off the month the second book we read was The Witch Queen of Halloween. This is a novella that was released this year by Cressley Cole, and it's about 164 pages. And this is the 20th entry into the Immortals After Dark series, and I love this series. It is my favorite fantasy romance series. I didn't realize there was 20 of those until I went to go put this book in my story graph and I was like, wow, there's 20 entries into that book. And looking at my shelf of Cressley Cole books, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so this book follows Poppy. That's Poppy right there. Uh, it's on the cover of the book. It follows Poppy and Rock. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. His name has the little circles over the O. I don't know how to pronounce that. I am terrible at pronunciation and I apologize. But Poppy and Rock. Poppy is a witch and a mercenary. She goes out on jobs to do specific things, whatever she's hired for, whether that's like assassinating somebody, 
saving somebody, protecting somebody, stealing items, all of that. And Rock has been another mercenary that's been in her sphere. Um, and he's also, well, he's also a mercenary and he's also a demon. And there's different type of demons within this universe. And what I really enjoy by Cressley, about Cressley Cole books are that they all interconnect. They're all little bits of pieces of puzzles. So the more you read of it, the more you learn about this rich world of these immortal characters and how somebody doing something in this book affects somebody doing something in this book and how all of that interconnects. And it happens more with her later books in the series. You can see it all just twining through uh, versus the earlier books. And I really enjoy that. But this, these two mercenaries are... They have a history. They went on a date previously, and one thing about Rock is any woman, whatever species they are, that he has slept with in the past can summon him. And he has to teleport to see them, and it's, it's, it's a thing with his species of demon specifically. And that happens when him and Poppy are on a date. And Poppy, after she's waiting there for a while, she's just like, all right, I'm done with this, I'm out. I'm cutting off all of my attraction I'm feeling for you. I am not, I'm not here for this. And she bounces. And the book takes place like a year after that. Like they've been they've been working with and against each other for years and years and years. But that that was the point where she was just like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to know about you. I just I'm done. I'm done. But they both go on this job to this creepy, eerie castle that it's an own little like not dimension, but its own little pocket. And there's a shield, everything around it. Like you can't get in and out of this castle except for one night a year. And that's Halloween. And the sunset of Halloween, it opens up and then during sunrise, it closes, something like that. And they go in there and they're trying to, he's trying to protect her because he ha he's still stupidly interested in her. He did not mean to get summoned by so many people and he was like, I really wanted to con co complete our date. He thinks she just took off on him, even though he explained like, this, I could get summoned and this could happen and it probably will and I apologize just wait for me and I'll be back as soon as I can he did not realize how how like how long he was gone so he's just thinking that she just walked out on him so he's still trying to pursue her they're in this creepy castle trying to find something <laughs> it doesn't really tell us what just something in this castle and so she's trying to find this. She has a curse that she's in that castle because there's something in that castle that will break her curse. So she's like, all right, I'm super excited about this. I'm going to do this. He followed her in there, lied to her, told her he's on a job, but, you know, let's work together. We can get through the night. And they start getting attacked by creatures that humans fear on Halloween. And it's a very specific thing. What I really enjoyed was the the horror movie icons and tropes and creatures and things that it would it can't obviously name the creatures in there, but it gave you enough hints that I was really excited reading through it. Be like, oh, I know what that one is. I know what movie franchise that's from. That's great. Go me. Two points for me. And it was it was really great. And it's just their night of doing that. And then the romance books things, you know, they happen and. It was, it was, it was okay. <laughs> it wasn't my favorite one out of this series. And I think that's mostly because it was a novella. So they smushed this whole relationship in, or she smushed this whole relationship into this novella. And I understand it. It still makes sense. Like I'll still probably reread it. But what I enjoy in her full length novels is the build up for the relationship, the the yearning, the character development that happens in these in these relationships that I'm just like, yes, I need that. I am just like, otherwise, why would I read it? Like, you know, why would I read it? And so it's it's 
took the whole book thing and just smushed it together. So it was very fast. It was very short. It was very like, okay, you guys got over these things really quickly. And I, like I said, I'll probably read it again, but it, it wasn't my favorite. But I really did enjoy the story. There was a secondary character that was introduced, like in the second half of the book. And I'm like, I want to know more about that character. I want to know what happened, how they got there, what's their happy haps, like what's going on with this character. I'm like, did they escape? Are they gone? They are swearing vengeance? Like, what's going on? I want to know. <laughs> so I rated this book a 3.5 out of 5. And like I said, I'll read it again. Not my favorite, but I'll read it again. And the third book we read this month was The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. And this is written by Grady Hendrix and published in 2020. And I read this on audiobook, so it was about 14 hours. And whew, this book, this book... I need this book in my life. Like it was, <laughs> it was hard for me to finish. I had to spread this out. Usually when I read an audio book, I have it at work. So when I start listening to it at work, I stop listening to it when I'm done with work and I'm on my way home. And this book, I had to stop it several times and be like, I need to, I need to calm down. I need to calm down. I'm ready to punch somebody. Like I am so angry. I'm so angry. And <laughs> this book is, it was, it was really great. It helped me like process some emotions. I did not know I still had. So this t book takes place in the 90s in a suburb suburban Southern neighborhood. And it follows Patricia, our main character. Patricia is a housewife. Like she did the whole Thing you're supposed to do like at the time she got married she had two kids she lives in a suburban area she's a housewife and so she's there like that's 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 her whole identity is being a wife and a mother and she joins a book club because she's trying to be like i just need something to do i need something to occupy she's like i like reading i'll join a book club except when she joins the book club the book club is super super pretentious just ridiculously pretentious and it covers like a lot of things that the people who are actually part of this book club they don't really doesn't really catch their interest doesn't really they don't really care about like going really deep into philosophy and all of this type of stuff and it's a lot of harder books to read that Patricia, she's like, I don't have time. I don't have time to read, you know, the super thick, thinky think book within the amount of time that they want me to. And she tries to, <laughs> she's just like, I'm not here for it. So she's like, I don't think I'll come back to book club. And while she's leaving, she meets a few other housewives that are there or like, you know, the mothers and the wives in the neighborhood. And they tell her they're going to start their own book club. They don't like this. Screw this. They're going to start their own book club. And she's like, can you do that? I don't think that's allowed. And they're like, well, we don't care. I'm not reading more of these books. So they start their own book club and they start reading. I don't want to say trashy books, but it's presented as trashy. There's the true crime novels that are like in the grocery store. I don't know if they still do that. Do they still do that? They used to be like a rack of kind of trashier novels that used to be in the grocery store. And she's talking about how she picks those up and she can devour those books. No problem. So they start a book club like that. It's just the, de the development of their book club and their friendship and how that evolves throughout the years. And while they're doing this, they're like, okay, Patricia ends up getting bored. Because we, we time skip, well, like years later. And they're still doing the same thing. She's still taking care of her kids. Her husband's like trying to go up for a promotion. So he's like, I'm going to be out a lot more and not be able to help you or be around. So like, I need you to deal with that. And she also has to take care of her sick mother-in-law who is having a lot of like dementia issues along with her failing health. So Patricia gets... And put in charge of taking care of her mother-in-law and she gets really bored with her life she, she gets really bored she's very much like i wish something would happen i wish something would happen i wish for something exciting which i get i understand that completely understandable 
And right when she's thinking all of these things, a man named James moves in to the neighborhood. She meets him and it's this big whole thing that's like a series of small events that happen. And then she meets him. And he's super charming. He's super articulate. He loves reading. And at the t- at the in the book, it's presented that you know men don't say this. They don't say it like I love to read. I love to read, and I read so many different types of novels. And even though he kind of like thumbs down, puts it like kind of is like, oh, you read trashy novels instead of like real novels. He's like, that's okay. I still enjoy that you read. She starts asking him oh, if he wants to come over for dinner, she's, he starts just integrating himself into her family life. And around that time, children start to go missing in this, this neighborhood and in surrounding towns. And Patricia thinks that it could be James. And she brings it to her book club and they all, they all start deciding like, well, maybe, maybe he is doing something to these children. They're like, how many times have we read about serial killers and <laughs> about all of these things that could happen in, in small towns like ours? It could be him. And they try to gather some evidence. They try to bring this forward to like gather as much evidence and everything to bring it in a coherent argument to police officers that so something can be done so they can protect the children. However, no one believes them. Their husbands don't believe them. And none of the other adults believe them. And what I found was super triggering for me was the way that the hus- these husbands treat their wives. And I was in a relationship that involved emotional and mental abuse, like a lot and a lot of manipulation. Like, I remember that. (laughs) I remember how these situations can just happen. And the way that these, some of these situations happen within the book between some of the couples and some of the people outside of the couples, like I'm not gonna say anything spoilery, but I was just, (sighs) (sighs) it brought back so many, I guess, unprocessed trauma and anger in me that I like. I had to stop. I had to stop reading the book. And I had to call my husband and be like, I, it's "Like, whew. I mean, I'm so angry. I'm so angry." <laughs> and so there is a lot of that. I would definitely check up the trigger warnings if you have issues with um, emotional abuse, uh, like emotional abuse, mental abuse, um, physical abuse, not shown on page, and child abuse. Those are the four things that I could think that'd be very triggering. All right, and so I would definitely check out those trigger warnings if those are something that can like hit you. I didn't know any of the trigger warnings. I didn't know the synopsis of this book. I just I just picked it up and decided, oh, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna read it. And yeah, <laughs> it took me a lot longer to get through because I was just so, just so angry and indoors. Like, my notes for this book. When I usually write my notes for books, I told you I'm trying to get better at this and write notes for you guys so I can tell you more of what's going on. Like, it's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages. Eight pages of notes. When I usually read a book, it's like, two to four pages at most. That was eight flipping pages of notes I took into this. So that's gonna be a fun video to do at a later time. (laughs) But I rated this a five out of five. Like it was tough for me to get through, but it was it was really good. It was really good. And the way that everything just happened at the end and I was just like this is like it was a satisfying ending, but at the same time it wasn't but it was still very good. It was very good. I rated it a five out of five. And the fourth book we read this month was Destroy All Cryptids. And this is the second book in the Cryptid series. It was written by David Haynes and published in 2021. And I read this on audiobook and it was approximately nine hours. And this is the second one. So the first one, I don't know if I said it, maybe it was in my last month's last month two months ago i don't remember but the first book i told you it was about a secret facility that tested on tested and cataloged cryptids and so this one picks up right after 
they escape, that facility is gone. And we have our main characters, Shaw and Captain Case, who... Oh, I don't want to tell you what happened, because that's spoilery for the first book. They're trying to make their way towards the facility. Yeah, I can tell you that. And <laughs> Nina and Dr. Brom are still, she still has him. And they're trying to make their way to find some, to find Case and Shaw. But they don't know about Shaw, so they're just trying to find Case. And, oh, I can't say it. <laughs> I'll tell you anyways. If you haven't seen the thing, well, no. Oh, okay, I won't say it. I won't say it, but the cryptids are loose. The cryptids are loose, except we are introduced to the higher level from the facility and then the directors. We are introduced to the higher level above the directors of who is it within the government pulling the strings of everything to make sure all of these things that are happening at the facilities we find out everyone was specifically chosen based on their psychological traits and how that would affect them performing their job duties interacting with cryptids so it turns into this huge conspiracy theory and you're getting little bits and pieces throughout the book and there are cryptid hunters, which I geeked out about. <laughs> I really geeked out about that. I love Supernatural, especially when they were hunting more cryptids before it turned into all angels and demons stuff. And so that was really fun. That was really fun for me. I got to follow them on their little adventures. They were two of the best characters, I feel, in the book. And this one I gave a four out of five. It was good. It was good. And since I knew it was a series, which I didn't know with the first one, I am fully expecting to get into the third one. The third one's not available through my library on audiobooks, so I'll have to find out how to get that book somewhere else. And that one is called Rose. That is the ending of the trilogy. And it just, just like with the first book, it kind of finishes this part of the journey of these characters and then just cuts off. So the next part, I feel like it'll have the full climax and everything confrontation with the characters in the book. So I'm really looking forward to that. I am really looking forward to that. <laughs> and the fifth book we read this month was Queen of the Damned. And this is the Vampire Chronicle series book three. And I read this on a combination of physically and digitally. Like, I don't have the individual book. I have this. The Anne Rice Van uh, Vampire Chronicles, like, little collection thing. It's very pretty. It's gold, which I love. And it has Interview with the Vampire, The Vampire Lestat, and Queen of the Damned. So I used that, and then I also had, um, had it on my tablet, so, you know, I wouldn't have to lug this giant book around. And this was published by Anne, or written by Anne Rice, published in 1988, which, whoop, whoop, year I was born, let's go. <laughs> and is 480 pages. I don't usually think 480 pages is like a really lot, but this book was dense. It was dense. And when I finished the vampire list at, I really wanted to jump into the Queen of the Damned because I was like, I need to know what happened. I really need to know what happened. Like, holy piss balls, I need to know. Give me more of Lestat. Like, that's what I need more in my life. And this book, the, <laughs> the introduction got me. Like, the first chapter is Lestat talking straight to you, the audience. And in my head, it's just it's Peter Townsend. I can't remember if that's the guy's name. And how he's talking, and I'm just like, yes, I love this. More list at, please. But it is way, way more story than that. It is, the stat's only in it just a little bit. He's only in it a little bit, and his part of the story can be condensed down probably to a couple of chapters. It's mostly following the story of the twins. And this, each chapter on this, each chapter on this is a different POV. It's a different character, it's a different perspective, and it's how all of these people just 
have these interactions with each other and how that affects the whole story. So you get bits and pieces of the story based on each of these POVs to give you the whole story. And towards the end, it felt like we were just catching up on things that were missed um, between the earlier chapters. Like the earlier chapters, they took more time with having just the story happen without us being told about it really. Like it was just show, not tell. The later parts of the chapter seem to be more tell, not show, which I it, it was the later books and the, the later chapters in the book started to feel like a slog to get through because of that. And because of the main story of the twins was told pr little bits and pieces throughout the first part of the book. So I knew their story. I didn't know it to the extent of what it was, but I knew the basis of their story. And the second part is that you have the twin story from their perspective. And that's just going through. And that took a lot of it. I was just like, I know this already. I know this already. The parts I didn't know, I was just like, oh, wow. Like, oh, okay. That makes sense to me. Uh, well, now I understand why you guys are the way you are. <laughs> and the ending didn't feel as spectacular as I thought, but it's very, the ending with how Lestat feels is very Lestat. Like if you read the, if you read the vampire Lestat is just very on point with how he would be and how he would react to what happened in the book. But it just, it took, it took a long time for me to finish this. It took a really long time for me to finish this. I enjoyed it. It was just, it was a lot to get through. And I really like how Anne Rice after that, like even people who've read Anne Rice told me that the rest of the books are broken up. Like instead of being smushed together, like in Queen of the Nam, they're like broken up. So I get one story in a book. So that's, I'm looking forward to more of the Anne Rice books. And I, we have a lot of them. I think I have a whole shelf full. But I rated this a 3.5 out of 5. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible. It was a 3.5 out of 5. It's still listed as good. It was just, it was just it was a lot to get through. It was a lot to get through. And some chapters, I just had to push myself to go through it. I'm like, I just have to push myself to go through it and get it done. And the sixth book we read was I Know What You Did Last Summer. So I read this one physically and I love this movie. I love like this movie and Urban Legend, you know, from the 90s are my jam. Like a lot. They're, they're some of my favorite movies to watch. And it was written by Lois Duncan and published in 1973. I did not know. I... I Know What You Did Last Summer was based off of a book, let alone a book that was published in the 70s. Like, whoa. <laughs> and I read this physically, and it was about 200 pages, and this story follows the story of four teenagers who, a year before, were involved in a hit-and-run accident that happened to cost the life of a young boy who... I forget how, I think he was about 10 years old, 10 or 11 years old, and it cost him his life. And a year later, they start getting, each of them in their own way, get a message that from somebody that says, I know what you did last summer. Our main character, uh, Jules, Julie, she gets an actual letter saying, I know what you did last summer. Everybody else kind of gets these more vague ways of telling them except for one of our main characters who I won't tell you because I'm not going to spoil it and it's way different than the movie obviously it's way different than the movie and even to the point where in the back I was reading the interview between Lois and an interviewer and they asked her what she thought of the movie and she said that she went into the movie was so excited to watch her book be made into a movie and watch the movie and was super upset and disappointed in the direction the movie took. And now knowing both of them, I can understand that. I can I can absolutely understand that. And she lost her daughter in a violent act. So 
I can I can I can really see why that why it would affect her the way it did, and she would just hate it. But I enjoyed the book. I rated it a four out of five. I was really surprised. I was really really surprised because again, I I knew the movie. I know I know the movie. I, I watch it a lot. Well, not as much as I used to, but I I I do know it. I do watch it repeatedly, and so it was it was way different. It was way different and I wasn't expecting that level of differences in it but it was so good I really enjoyed it and I gave it a four out of five and number seven was if love could kill and this was written by Anna Motz and it was published in 2024 and it was an audiobook and it was about 10 and a half hours and this is a nonfiction book that was written by Anna Motz. Anna Motz is a forensic psychologist who works a lot with incarcerated women or used to before she created her own practice. Um, like there's a whole bi a biography of her. She's written several books about uh, violence and women. And this book covers why women commit violent acts. And it's broken up into different sections. Why women commit violent acts against themselves, so self-harm. Why women commit acts against children and why women commit acts against their partners. And she goes through different case, cases that she was involved in. So the, a lot of these are her patients. And obviously she changes, changed their names and everything. We're not given any names or any dates to be able to find out who these women are. And it breaks it up into each little section like that. And then she goes into the cases and what she what she came away with the case knowing about these women and how that i'm not no i don't know the word and how that affects how their uh, their previous actions were like a lot of these women were not commanded, required, I guess, to see her to, as a forensic psychologist or forensic therapist. Um, she gives her whole qualifications in the beginning, and it was it was really good. I really enjoyed hearing about the the core reasons on why these women were committing the acts that they were. And it's not like she fixed all of these women. She was talked about successful cases of where she was able, like she's like to this day, she can keep an eye on this person, even from a distance and be like, this person's still okay. This person is going to be okay. And then to the other cases to where her interactions with them were not successful at all. And to be able to look at both cases and to figure out like what you can gain from that as a professional, I think was really great. And she went through her thought process on it and everything. It was it was really good. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very informative. And I gave this a four out of five. And the eighth book we read this month was called Wings of Ink. And it is part of a part of the Wings of Ink series, book one. And this was written by Angelina Stefford and published in 2024. And I read it on an audiobook and it was approximately 11 hours. And the way I think of this book is, did you read, like, if you read A Court of Court of Thorn and Roses, I think it's called. As people just keep calling it Akatar. <laughs> like A Court of Thorn and Roses, I think is what it's called, which is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. And I read it, I think, two years ago. And I thought it was crap. I did not enjoy that book. I refused to read the rest of the series because it was just... It just it annoyed me so much. I was not into that book at all. I'm like, I don't care for either of these characters, any of these characters. And then towards the end, I'm like, oh, well, she's obviously going to spurn this guy for some reason and go with that guy. Obvious. Like, you just said it right there. And I don't like how the main character in that one was like Mary Sue. And I'm just like, oh, this is so stupid. This is just so stupid. Like, there was no development of the characters at all. Like, but it annoyed me. And I love Beauty and the Beast. I love a Beauty and the Beast retelling. But that book, I was just like, I can't do it. I can't do it. This is the book that I think you should read if 
you needed more for from A Court of Thorn and Roses. If you needed actual characters who actually think on things and you are given their actual thought processes and why they do the things they do, why they made the decision they made, you can directly correlate that to be like, oh, okay, well, as I learn more about this character, I get it. I understand why that person's the way they are and why they're doing the things they're doing. And while it goes through the same basic type of storyline that A Court of Throwing the Roses, Beauty and the Beast, any of those type of books go through, this one was way more dense with the fantasy elements of it, which I really enjoyed. The Fae in this one, one, they were not nice. And I know they kept saying that in A Court of Thorn and Roses. They're like, oh, they're just evil and mean. But we didn't see that until like towards the end. And it was only with the evil fae that we saw it. And I was just like, okay. These ones, they're like, they lost their reason to be nice. They were cursed to be monsters. And so they became monsters. And the way that they interact with the main character, well, the way the main character gets there before, it was, it made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense to me on how that whole process went through. It wasn't because somebody did some specific thing like in other books. It was just like, no, 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 this makes sense. This is what would really happen if this whole situation was required. This is what would happen. And this person was specifically chosen, and you find out why, and you're like, oh, damn. That is, like, I can hold a grudge, but damn. Damn. <laughs> and it was, it was, ugh, I enjoyed it way more than that. I think I'll definitely pick up the second book um, when I'm ready to, really. Like, the, the first book ended, and I was like, oh. I'm kind of hesitant, though, because it ended kind of like, what was that movie that everybody kept telling me to watch? It's on Netflix. I thought it was going to be really good, but that one was terrible. I don't know. If I remember, I'll put a graphic on the screen. And, but it, the ending kind of reminded me of that, so I'm like, mm, I don't know how I'm digging that. I'm, I'm not knowing how I, dig, how I dig that ending. But at the same time, I'm really invested in these characters. I really want to know what happens to these characters because, like, okay, this is – this is – it's way more adult without having – it's a Court of Thorn and Roses, everybody was just like talking about the spicy scenes. This one has those scenes, but it's the story as a whole is more adult. It's more, it was just, it was just more my flavor. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. I enjoyed it. I think, like I said, I'll probably pick up the second book, but it was to me a lot of what the other books were lacking. So I was like, yeah, I like it. <laughs> Uh, the ninth book we read was Bleed, and we read that physically, and it's about 240 pages, and it was written by, I can't pronounce her name, Lori Stolarts, Stolarts, Stol, Stolarts, <laughs> I think that's how you pronounce it, and I read it, phys read it physically, it was 240 pages, and this book follows a bunch of teenagers, this whole book is one day. This whole book is one day. And, but it's showing different, every chapter is a different perspective of a different teenager in this friend group. And it's how they all get through this one day. And uh, it's, it's good. This is, this is a reread. I have read this one before. It's one of my favorite books. I really enjoy this author. Um, she published this in 2006 so that was a long time ago and it reads like it was from the early 2000s but being as i was i grew up in the late 90s early 2000s and stuff i'm like okay that's still that's my jam that, that like it hits me with the nostalgia and everything i'm like okay i understand this and but it follows all of these different teenagers and goes throughout their day starting from the very morning where um, it's our, one of our characters, Nicole, who has a crush on her best friend's boyfriend. She interacts with him 
in the first chapter and then all the way to them interacting again at the very end and all that went in between and how each of these you get their backstory for each of these characters and some of them you're just it just hits you in the feels with some of these characters I'm just like I just like I just want to help you I just I just want to help you I just want to help you <laughs> and all the other characters some of the other characters you're like well you get everything you deserve for this like you get everything you deserve karma is just gonna come up and slap you in the face and we kind of see that a lot in the book and I was like I like it. I like it. And it's just all these kids interacting with each other and themselves while growing up in this town uh, over a summer break. And like I said, it happens all in one day and it's really good. I rated this a four out of five. I enjoy it. I will probably read it again. I've read it like four or five times. <laughs> like I'll, I'll continue to read it. It's just something that's comfortable for me to read, even though it covers some, some hard things to cover. So Check out a trigger warning list if you guys want to read this, especially if you call if it's um, if you have an issue with blood, if you have an issue with self harm, if you have uh, some of the issues like that. Definitely check out the trigger warning list before you read it. But I enjoy it. I really like the author. I have her whole Blue is for Nightmare series that I read every now and then, and I enjoy it. And the tenth book we read this month was Bride. And this was written by Allie Hazelwood and published in 2024. And I read this digitally and it was 399 pages. And this is the second book of Allie Hazelwood's that I have read. The first one we read was Check and Mate. And if you want to know my thoughts and feelings on that, you can check out the TDLR. I haven't done the full review of it yet as time of recording this. If it's there, check that out too. <laughs> You'll understand why I say what I say in the book. But this one is, this one's different. Ellie Hazelwood usually does like check and make type of books. Like, you know, it's kind of modern times in, there's like no, no fantasy to it really. This book is in a fantasy setting. So you have the vampires and the wares and the humans. These are the three factions that have territory split up and each of their governments have to interact with each other, maintain alliances so there's not a full out war and all of that type of things. Our two main characters, um, our main female character is Misery is her name and the main love interest is Lo. And it is a, I don't want to say fake marriage trope because they they do get married i guess a forks forced proximity trope it's a romance novel between misery and low misery is a vampire low is aware not only is he aware he is the alpha of the where where's the southwest pack is what he is in charge of and misery grew up in, around humans because she was l collateral so the way the system works is to, as a show of good faith, and I don't know why this is a show of good faith, but this is their whole system. They have a collateral system. So to keep an alliance between like the vampires and the humans, a vampire child is given to the humans to raise and a human child is given to the vampires to raise. And Misery being the daughter of a prominent councilman was one of those children so she was raised with the humans and i don't know why this system is a thing how it's supposed to work but this is just how things are done in this world and to create like once she's older and everything to create another alliance with her the wares, she is going to be offered up as a wife for the alpha ware, and she begrud begrudgingly does it, and she does it with a specific purpose. Like, there's a very specific reason why she's doing it, and we don't really know. We kind of know at the beginning, and then it's kind of sprinkled throughout the book, and I don't understand why this particular way of her accepting it would be like the best course for her to complete her whole objective like i understand her objective i i completely understand the motivations for that i just don't understand why that was the best thing to do but hey plot reasons right and so she goes into the wear territory and she is she's there and 
there's like this whole this whole thing going on. Like I'm not going to give you guys any spoilers with it, but it's just those two low and misery interacting with the world around them. Misery interacting with wares and then the vampires are in it and the humans are in it and the politics of this. The ending, I'm like, "Ha, that makes sense. That makes sense." I was wondering why they were pushing this narrative and then this narrative. And I'm like, "This one kind of makes sense. This one doesn't." But the ending, when we get to know what's really going on, I'm like, ah, ha, 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 I get you. I get you. And I understand it. It brought in a whole new, um, I guess, type of kink that I did not know was a thing. And I don't, I don't want to kink shame anybody. I was just like, it was, it was a big thing in the book. Like the second half of the book, once we found out this was a thing, like it was a big thing that was there. Ha! <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> I'll put it on the screen. If you want to look up what that is, just remember it is not safe for work. It is, it is, is, is a thing. It is very graphic. And, and apparently very time consuming. Okay, okay. I'll put it on the screen. If you guys want to look it up, look it up. I was just, it caught me off guard. And I was just like, I was confused. And then I had to reread a few things and I was just like, oh. Okay, but it's also very graphically depicted in the book and explained, it's fully explained in the book. So you can read the book, you can look it up or you can wait until I come out with my TDLR, or my review for it. it will not be child friendly. <laughs> But I rated this a three out of five. I enjoyed it a lot more. Misery had some super sarcastic humor and the way she talked. And it reminds me of how I talk to a lot of people. So I really enjoyed that. It cracked me up a lot of the times. And her and her and her her whole story, like I get it and I understand it. And I'm just like, oh. like I think I know what the problem is, but I don't want to say it. <laughs> with a lot of this but it was a, it was an interesting I mean, there was a lot of parts where I was giggling at it and just like ha that's funny and like I said or three out of five and the 11th book we read this month was Hillbilly Elegy is that how you, I think that's how you pronounce it a memoir of a family and culture in crisis and this was written by JD Vance and published in 2016 and I read it on an audio as an audio book and it was about seven hours and I read this book because of certain things that are happening currently now because curiosity and this book covers this is a nonfiction book that covers a lot of the growing up culture of Appalachian like poor Appalachian families and being as I am I'm from a poor area and I didn't, I was raised amongst others in my tribe, so I wasn't exposed to a lot of things as a child. And not until I grew up and I went off into the world. And when I went off into the world, I met a lot of people like this and who were really poor white kids. Like, just, and they grew up in the country and they were very, you know, hillbilly families. Like, I realized that was a thing and I was like, oh, okay, that's a real thing. Okay. And when we would talk about our childhood and the places we came out with, the, the parallels of it were pretty ridiculous. And to hear, um, hear the talk of this one, and he brings up a lot of research papers and a lot of studies that have been done for low income areas um, in white neighborhoods and minority um, dominant neighborhoods and for children as a whole. So you get kind of an idea of where things are. Pretty much he just goes over the his family and how that family was not special. Like how the family is indicative of the culture that was cultivated in that particular area and all throughout the area where these type of people live and the common pitfalls that children fall into and adults as well and how how he was able to deal with it because he had the support of his grandmother and grandfather and how other people who did not have support with those have a harder time dealing with it if they ever do and how it becomes a systemic problem generationally and um, 
He talks about policies that people are trying to in place or did try to uh, input that could address some of the problems and how things could actually help and then how things cannot. And I get it. I, it made a lot of sense to me being from, like I said, I was kind of in from a similar place. Like I under, I understood a lot of what happened in this book. And there was a lot of sympathy that I was like, okay, I remember being that kid who had to deal with this specific situation. Or I remember my friend had to deal with this specific situation. And like, I get it. I get it. But it was just a book that I read. It was a 3.5 out of 5, I think. I may take that down to the 3. It wasn't like groundbreaking things. But it was something we read this month. And number 12, which I feel was the bestest book that we read this month. And I was super excited I was able to finish it in July. <laughs> was Survivor by Chuck Palahniuk. Paula Nook? I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. This was written in 1999. And this is the author of Fight Club, obviously. A lot of people know what Fight Club is. If you haven't read the book, you're probably like me and saw the movie. I read a different series, the newer series that Chuck Paula Nook wrote. I think it's two or three books. I read those and I thought those were great. I had no idea I would love this book so much. First of all, like you can see all my little note taking tabs in here. <laughs> this book is backwards. Like that tripped me out. I'm like that alone would like have me start reading it. So it started off at page 289 and chapter I think 44 or 43 and then goes backwards. And what it is we're following a person who hijacked a plane and is was told by the pilot how to kind of pilot the plane and what to watch out for as he's going to crash down and die. And so he hijacked a plane and he is telling his life story to the black box in the plane that'll be found. <laughs> that's the limit and that's how it starts off is the hijacking of the plane. And I was like, "Okay." And then it goes backwards to how he went and got to where he was. And I was just, I, it, it wrinkled my whole brain. Like even the back of it. Tender Branson, last surviving member of the so-called Creedish death cult, is dictating his life story into the flight recorder of flight 2039, cruising on autopilot at 39,000 feet somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. He is all alone in the airplane, which will crash shortly into the vast Australian outback, but before it does, he will unfold the tale of his journey from an obedient Cretish child and humble domestic servant to an ultra-buff steroid and collagen-packed media messiah. And whew, the characters in this book were just ridiculous they were ridiculous but ridiculously relatable and that's what i really enjoyed about this book i i have not an obsession like a, just a healthy interest in cults and true crime so being able to see the effects of some of these things that happen in here and it tells you it was just like uh, reading through it and through the background of the cult and everything i was just like i know these stories i I know the cults that did this. Like, I understand this. Like, even some of it, I had to put that down. I'm like, did I read this before? Or is this just through the time spiral? And I'm just remembering things that I haven't read yet because I'm pretty sure I know which cult did this. <laughs> like, for realsies. Except I didn't look into it anymore. And I was just like, obviously, I'm just putting things that aren't there. But it was so so good and how the other characters interact with them with him in this book and then how he interacts with the world as a whole like a lot of it you get his inner monologue as well as the things that he's saying to other characters and it's just it is so good this is all from his perspective this whole thing is from his perspective and even when he is talking with other characters in the book, you can still get the inner the inner dialogue that he's telling himself and how he has some cognitive dissonance on when they're trying to tell him what really happened. And then you have people telling him, no, that never happened. Don't worry about that. 
And the way that his agent is in here and that whole company is just like, wow. Yeah, I can see that happening. I can I can see all of this happening and that is terrifying. That is terrifying. This one is definitely my favorite that I read this month. Like I said, I read it and these are all my little note taking tabs that I still have to go through and get quotes from and figure out like the little things I want to mention in the video that I make for you guys. So definitely watch out for that. There'll be a condensed version in the TDLR and then I'll do the whole video, which might take forever. I don't know. Like I want to... <laughs> I just kind of want to read you guys the book. It is so good. So I'm going to try not to do that and just kind of give some concise points. But we'll see how that goes. Obviously, I rated this a 5 out of 5. And that's what I read in July. I almost said June. And I'm going to put up some a graphic for my story graph wrap up, which I didn't know you could do this on story graph. You can go onto story graph and get your it has your stats page and then you can get a little a little nice little graphic. Like when you have the Spotify music wrap up or the YouTube music wrap up, which I enjoy seeing every year. And that's was pretty great. My average rating for this month was 3.85. I read 12 books. Uh, 1,955 pages read and 71.13 hours listened to. Good. Half of what we read was audio, half was physical and digital, and it was just great. I really enjoyed it. And you can it print. You can have like a whole little thing with all the a collage. That's what it's called. A book cover collage as well from it. So if you want to put a book cover in like your reading journal for the month and everything, you just print it out. You just print it out. Like, that's so great. I didn't know that was a thing. I did not know that was a thing, but it's a thing. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you guys are having an amazing day, night, afternoon, whatever it is where you are. What did you guys read this July? Did you guys read anything? Did you guys watch anything good? Oh, I watched some good movies too this month. And that's in my Discord. If you want to hang out in my Discord, that's where I put the movies I'm watching, the TV shows I'm watching, and my thoughts and feelings on them. And you can check out where my socials in the link below if you guys want to be friends with me on Storygraph or follow me and I'll follow you too. I want to know. I'm, I'm a little nosy. I want to know what people are reading and how they're enjoying things. My Storygraph link is down there as well. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Don't forget to do all the YouTube things like subscribe, follow, comment, whatever. I hope you guys have an amazing time and I will talk to you guys next week. Bye.